Captain, there be whales here. Hello, interwebs. I hope you're all doing well and are just as excited as I am because we need to talk about the fifth episode of Star Wars Ahsoka, this episode titled Shadow Warriors. And oh boy, I will stay spoiler free for a second, everybody, but this was by far, by far, far the strongest episode of definitely Ahsoka so far and quite possibly the strongest live action Star Wars episode to date not counting Star Wars Andor. I always have to put like that asterisk on on everything I say when I talk about like this being a great episode of live action Star Wars because Andor is kind of like in a league of its own. Um, but you know that aside this was just I think really amazing delivering on quite a few fronts that I would not have expected uh, a Disney Star Wars property uh, to be able to deliver, namely in how it utilized nostalgia in a way that not only like did the nostalgia thing of like, oh look, we get to see the thing that we like wanted to see, but in live action now, isn't that cool? Oh, look at your little nostalgia heart uh, going off. Like it delivered on that level, but actually used that nostalgia in a way to reframe it in a really intriguing way that I, I was really nervous at the end of last episode when we saw Hayden Christensen coming back that this episode was not going to be able to do because one of the biggest problems with Disney Star Wars generally has just been its constant need to just be like point at the things that we used to like from the past and say didn't you like that thing here it is again slash slightly remixed or you know with a different face on it but the same basic story being told and instead here this episode was talking about that history that particularly Ahsoka has uh, with all of Star Wars that we've seen to this point and, and using that as a commentary on how to push forward in a new uh, new way, which is something that I have needed, needed Star Wars to do uh, for a very long time and has not been happening under Disney Star Wars at all. And so I think making that the theme of this episode was so smart and we have to yet wait to see if that is actually going to be carried through with, you know, the rest of Ahsoka slash the rest of Disney Star Wars generally going forward from this point. But this episode I think was a, a good signifier to me personally that they can do this. And there's a lot more that I really liked about this episode, namely Rosario Dawson's performance and stuff with uh, Jace and all the other characters that really felt like they were finally getting into some of the more intriguing stuff that I've been waiting for the show to get to. But to talk about all of that, in, I think in more detail, I'm going to have to talk spoilers. So let's get into spoilers to talk all of that. All right, we will get to the Hayden Christensen of it all in a second, y'all. Uh, but let's start off talking about like Hera and Jace stuff here. I really adored when they came to the planet and they were looking around and they found Hu Yang, who was just doing this adorable little like sad droid face. Being like, I just told them to stay together. I'm like, oh, Hu Yang, my baby. I just wanted to give you a hug. Uh, and I just love that like arc for his character of this feeling of like he failed as a guide for these two and, and sort of recognizing where their failure was and not sticking together, not being that united team that he knows that they can be, I thought was really kind of a, a adorable and sad and heartbreaking moment. But the moment that I loved the most here was Jace going and listening out over the water. And there was this kind of creepy vibe of him saying like, no, listen, you can hear the lightsabers. And I loved Hera sort of trusting him, number one. I just loved the idea that Hera's like, yeah, no, I'm in, I'm in on this force stuff. I wasn't like, come on, Jace. And like, I, I hate those storylines of parents not listening to their kids when the kids clearly know something. Like, no, she was all in on it. And she listened and just hearing the lightsabers come out of the waves was such a, just, I don't know, there was just something eerie but in a cool way about that, that I really loved. I think the only thing that I didn't like about this sequence, uh, ultimately leading to Hera like constantly looking and trusting in uh, the fact that her son knows something and leading to, you know, Ahsoka being saved from the water. The only part that I didn't like about this was Hu Yang's bit where he says like, oh, Jace has, you know, some abilities. His father was a Jedi, referring to Kanan from Star Wars Rebels. Um, and I get why that line's there, but there's a part of me that like, I think the stronger aspects of this show when it comes to Sabine and also the better parts of The Last Jedi, as divisive as that was, is the more democratization of the force. And so, you know, calling to, you know, Jace being, you know, a son of a Jedi and that's why he has these powers, I was a little like, 
oh, come on, it's going kind of cutting against those themes of like Sabine uh, being able to use the force in some way, shape or form and being herself in that um, and, and made it more about this hereditary thing. It's a small thing and I get why it's there. It's just one of those things that like, it's a tiny bit that I'm overthinking, but it rubbed me the wrong way, given, you know, Star Wars, other places that it's leaned into like the hereditariness of the force. But all of this brings us to what we're all here for, right? And that is Hayden Christensen back as Ahsoka. And there were so many theories about what this uh, Hayden Christensen was, whether it actually was, you know, Anakin, was this Darth Vader just reincarnated, was like a, a force spirit talking to her. And none of those are 100% confirmed, but I love the way that this guides us through it and how I personally interpret this. And I'd be curious to hear down in the comments if you interpret this uh, appearance of Anakin in the same way as I do. Because... The first sequence, he appears to her as, you know, I'm here to finish your training and I'm here to help guide you. And they start doing this battle and it becomes about this ideological stance of, you know, do you live or do you die? And I love that the way that that gets framed is through this discussion of, you know, what Anakin passed on to, uh, to Ahsoka directly, but also the legacy that Ahsoka was in, is within having been a student of him uh, and him having directly fallen into fascism and also the Jedi generally, something that she kind of pushes up against. And I think there's so many both political and personal implications being said in just a few lines going on here that I thought was really intelligent and a really great conversation commentary on Star Wars. So get, let's kind of get into it. We get in these fight sequences between them, which is really, really fun. And then uh, Anakin knocks her down and she falls and we get to kind of a live action version of Clone Wars complete with a young Ahsoka. And the actress who played young Ahsoka, she was so good, like one of the better child actors. I know many people called out Leia uh, in the Obi-Wan show for being a bad child actor. I didn't mind her as much as other folks, but here this actor was top notch. Sadly, we didn't get to see the, uh, I figured Ashley John I believe was her name, the actor who played Ahsoka in um, in the animated series. Uh, but, uh, you know, I understand she's probably too old for the part now, but I, there was a part of me like, oh, is it her? But no. Um, but we got to see these Clone Wars snippets, and this calls to that nostalgia I was talking about earlier, right, of like uh, Star Wars just playing into the look. You get to see the live action thing of the animated version that you get to see, and even these snippets, I don't remember all of them, uh, but even these snippets that we get are all directly like pulls from specific episodes of the Clone Wars, uh, culminating in the Siege of Mandalore, which was the series finale of the Clone Wars that we got just a few years ago, wrapping out that series. And we got to see that in live action in one of these vignettes. But I think all, every single one of these is a specific callback to a specific episode. I just can't remember them off the top of my head. I'm sure there's Easter egg sites for that if you want them. Um, but the first one that we get here is, and I also love the look of this too. It was smartly done with all of the smoke and you get to see these big things and the shadows going through, like the walkers and the clone troopers coming out of the darkness. Like it was just very creepy and the vibe was cool and yet was able to like play within, I'm sure, budget limitations. Like it would have been weird if we had to be in like the, the VR wall thing that they always do, the volume. Uh, I, I've been on record that I don't, the volume can be used in particular ways that I do find okay but ultimately I don't love it. Um, so here this plays against using the volume and using this sort of like weird ethereal space to play with that and add a sense of like creepiness to the whole proceedings that I loved. But this leads us into what the actual discussion was about how Anakin in his sort of Clone Wars form, which is so cool to see that, I just love that, being like, oh, look, you you know, we're going to fight. We're being soldiers. And it, it, it just reminded me like, you know, Star Wars is child soldiers all the way down. Even the clone troopers themselves are, are child soldiers. And getting to see young Ahsoka, like not an animated form, like really brought that home. And this idea of like, what are we teaching kids uh, in terms of like, be a soldier, be a fighter, fight for this machine die, this like cult of death uh, that is cultivated under, uh, you know, this this sort of mindset that Anakin eventually falls into as he becomes Darth Vader. Uh, and him sort of things, telling, you know, snips like, oh, we need to be ironic. We need to make jokes about everything. We can't take this stuff seriously. You know, you need to worry about, you know, fighting and we can make mistakes. People die. I take that seriously. But, you know, you just constantly need to learn how to fight to be a soldier. That's what you're always going to be. That's what we need to be as Jedi. Uh, and then, uh, and, and that is a very fascistic mindset, right? Of fascism is this ultimately, you know, cult of death that is always thinking about like fighting and and always has an other to go against and and is sort of is generated in Anakin and manipulated by Palpatine to turn you know the Republic uh, into the Empire and Anakin into Vader and that sort of being something that. Ahsoka brushes up against when talking with Anakin is sort of like, is this all I'm going to be? Is this all I'm going to be able to pass on to my Padawan like Sabine? And we clearly get allusions to Sabine there. And her thing is like, can, can we become more? Can the Jedi be more? Can 
I be more? Can can we can this cycle be broken of this constant, you know, fall into fascism, pull back out, fall into fascism again, pull back out, fall into fascism again? Um, and also this constant like cycle of the Jedi being peacekeepers, then becoming soldiers, peacekeepers, soldiers, um, and, and that playing out in a very personal way for her that I thought was very smart. And the imagery of Anakin walking away and turning into Vader in the shadows was creepy as all hell and it, it spoke to the uh that that idea of like anakin's falling into this mindset and it coming back to the siege of mandalore and it was cool to see the siege of mandalore cool to see rex for a quick hot minute there uh i believe played by tamar morrison in that appearance as opposed to d bradley baker who played him i believe in the uh the animated show which you know consistent with tamar morrison playing uh him in in live action which i'm all here for but it was just in it was interesting to hear rex played by tamar morrison for a quick minute there um, but leading to this where, you know, Anakin uh, starts being like, you you are my legacy. This is, you, everything I am is going to continue on you and everything before is going to continue on to you. Like, this is just the cycle of how things go. You never get to be your own person. You are just the demands of this, this oppressive legacy on you as a person. And Ahsoka being like, but if all I am is you, am I just Darth Vader? Am I just going to end up this angry, embittered, lonely person? And this gets into the way that I think Orsario Dawson has been playing Ahsoka and, and realizing now it's like, this is the mindset that she's been thinking about. It's like, am all I going to be is this, is what Anakin became. And that's why she's been so standoffish from Sabine. And you get little moments with her and Anakin where she smiles and she plays with him a little bit, even in even in her like sort of standoffishness. Um, and and you get to see like her getting drawn out and becoming more hopeful, more more open, um, and and starting to see like no, I don't have to be this way. Ultimately, leading to this fight with Anakin uh, it, back in the world uh, between worlds, and it was so wonderfully like I honestly like as much as I love the fight in Obi Wan uh, the show, uh, as the show itself is, was not great, but the fight between Obi Wan and Anakin I thought I loved particularly the moment where like Anakin's face was like cut in half, and you get to see like Darth Vader's face and Hayden Christensen's face in that show. I actually like this better where like Hayden Christensen's voice mixed for a second with Darth Vader's voice and his eyes turning red and glowing uh, and getting angry. And this is where Snips finally uses her two lightsabers, like using her classic style. Um, this is the moment she does that when fighting back against him. And ultimately, she get, I love the moment where she like pulls the lightsaber on him and he is, it gets the red lightsaber and you can see the red eye, light in her eye reflected in it. And like she could fall to the dark side, fall into that fascist mindset. We always kill, we always, you know, kill the people that came before us and take their spot, that sort of like, Sith viewpoint on the world, and she doesn't. And that's where the moment where Anakin steps back and says, there's hope for you yet. And I loved this because the way I read it is this actually was, um, this was Anakin, but obviously very post Return of the Jedi, learning his mistakes and understanding that he, you know, he did the things that he did, he was Darth Vader, but he can pass on to Ahsoka to not be that through the force and be like, you can be something different. You don't have to be me. And so that moment where it says, ah, yeah, uh, there's hope for you yet. That's him realizing you're not going to make the same mistakes I do. You're going to learn from seeing what I did. Um, and I, and, and uh, you know, whether it was symbolic or, you know, actually Anna can do it, it was, it was, I thought it was beautiful. And I think honestly, a beautiful end to, you know, Anakin's arc here, like not just Ahsoka. And I think it was brilliant for Ahsoka. But for Anakin specifically, to give him this final moment, not just with Luke, but with, with, with Ahsoka, I thought, was, I thought was great. And it did what I was talking about before, where this, this episode used nostalgia to say, we don't have to repeat this over and over and over again. We can make something new, which is what I need Disney Star Wars overall to do. Instead of telling the same stories again and again and again and again and again, do something new. So I, I hope that this episode becomes indicative of a large mentality with Star Wars going forward. We shall see if that ends up being the case. I do not necessarily trust large corporations run by, you know, people who are currently pushing back against their writers and actors uh, to be able to get paid well, to be able to think with that sort of creativity in mind. Um, but one one has to have eternal hope. You know, we always have to hope for, for more. Um, so, you know, that, that hopefully is indicative of, of that mindset. But I loved this. And then I loved, you know, Ahsoka getting saved. It was weird to see Ahsoka without her like headpiece for a minute. I was like, oh, this feels like I'm seeing Ahsoka naked when she's making up. Like, I didn't like it. I didn't like it at all. It was very weird to see him in live action. Um, but then her wearing all white, which felt like not only a call to like, you know, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, 
whiteness of the force, the whiteness of her light, lightsabers, which, you know, uh, maybe whiteness is the wrong word to use here, but like her wearing white and it calling back to, for me, like a Lord of the Rings uh, call back to like Gandalf the White after he had been Gandalf the Grey. It felt very much evoking that sort of idea uh, with her costuming. And the moments that she gets with Hu Yang were a wonderful, um, and the moments that she gets with Jace, um, you know, and, and him being sent off with Hu Yang uh, and Hu Yang being like, no, yes, no to his questions. I loved and then we get to the New Republic and the New Republic like calling Hera in is like, you're gonna be come back, we, we need you to come back or else you're going to like lose your job. You need to come back with Ahsoka to stand up for you because you're gonna be on trial now. Um, and then the fleet showing up uh, and, and you know, poor Carson having to hold them off. I, I did feel like the Carson stuff, like the actor played it kind of well. Like there was some, I feel like it was supposed to be more funny than it ended up being. Like the actor I think was giving a very clear like comedic delivery when he's like talking to the fleet commander. Um, and I think he did a great job, but just like the pacing of it was a bit off. And I think it goes to uh, perhaps the editing or even Dave Filoni who directed this episodes. Uh, you know, he's, he's not, you know, he's not a long time director. And so it may go to his directing ability that I don't, I just don't think the pacing was exactly right on the delivery of, of the comedy with that. It was, again, it wasn't bad and the actor was given his best, but it just didn't entirely land. I, I think, I think the pacing just needed to be quicker for those, those jokes to hit a little bit better and, and fully capture the actor's performance because, you know, at, comedy is all about timing. Um, so, uh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, so yeah, uh, loved all of that except for that little critique there. But this all leads to Ahsoka going to the Purgles, which I loved. Uh, I was like, as soon as I saw the Purgles, I'm like, oh, that's how they get there. Like, duh, duh. That makes so much sense, but I just didn't think about it. Um, and her using a pergol to be able to get to where uh, Sabine and probably Thrawn and Ezra are. Um, so I'm very excited to see where that goes. And it was a really wonderful capstone to this episode and really felt like, oh, Ahsoka has, has grown. Um, from this and it just this the way Rosario Dawson plays it like a little bit more smiles like a little bit more emotive um, I think really gets to that shift. It's very subtle, but it's a really good performance. I feel like um, Again, you know my, my stuff with Rosario Dawson aside uh, So yeah, I, I ultimately I think this was really really great I think this was one of the best episodes of live-action Star Wars again asterisk and not not counting and or um, And I, I think they nailed this and again, hopefully it is a sign of better things to come for Star Wars going forward, but who knows, only time will tell. But with all that said, I hope you all are doing well. I'd love to hear all of your thoughts about this episode as well down below, but beyond all that, my friends, I hope you all live long and prosper.